Hey there, TCC. Happy New Year. We're so glad that you tuned in to our online service. My name is Ty Davis, and I'm on staff here at Tulare Community Church. The new year always brings a special excitement along with it, and we're looking forward to starting a new year of ministry with you. Starting next Sunday, our normal Sunday service schedule will resume. We'll be back to three in-person services each week. South Campus is at 9 a.m. in the sanctuary. North Campus is at 10.30 a.m. in the activity center. And East Campus is in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. And of course, if you're not able to join us in person, we'll continue to meet you here online each week as well. Our weekly ministries are also on their last week of winter break before everything resumes. High school ministry resumes on January 9th. Women's Bible study will be back to their weekly meetings starting January 11th and 12th. And midweek is also back on January 12th. We're gonna hold a congregational meeting on Monday, January 10th in the Activity Center regarding our affiliation with the RCA. We'll share the latest updates and take a vote with all members in attendance. If you're a committed disciple, which is what we call our members, we strongly encourage you to attend that meeting and childcare will be available. There will be plenty more coming up as we begin 2022, so be sure that you are on the list to receive our TCC weekly email sent every Thursday. Those emails contain all the latest on what's going on at and through TCC. If you don't get those emails and you'd like to, just reach out to our office and we'll gladly add you to that list. Also, if you're interested in speaking to a pastor, requesting prayer, or learning more about Tulare Community Church, you're always welcome to reach out to our office anytime. We'd love the opportunity to meet you. Well, we're going to throw it back to the band on stage now as they lead us in a time of worship together. Whatever brought you here today, we are so glad that you've joined us, and I pray that this will be an opportunity for you to hit pause on whatever's going on around you and really focus your heart and mind on hearing from the Lord. Today, we choose to praise His name. Regardless of what is happening around us in the world or what is going on in our own lives, we choose to glorify Him because He is worthy and He is good. So let's join together in worship now. Take it away, team.
Good morning, church. Welcome back to our second and final week of our Christmas Tide series. 
Coming out of Advent season, Christmas tide asked us, well, now what? And so we're spending a couple of weeks looking at the early life of Jesus and the way that he not only maneuvered his way through life, but also how he was received by those around him. And Luke does a phenomenal job of guiding us through these pivotal early years of the king come to earth. Let's take a look at our scripture today. Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth. But Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. His parents didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic, searching for you everywhere. But why did you need to search, he asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. This is the word of the Lord. Grace be to God. Out of the four gospels, Luke is the only writer to include so much of the early life of Jesus. And even then, it's not a whole lot. He records the infancy of Jesus that we've been covering the past few weeks leading up to Christmas, and then there's a gap in time until he's 12 years old. We get this story, and then there's another gap in time from 12 years old to when Jesus was about 30 years old. So while we may want more stories from the life of young Jesus, it's important to focus on what Luke was hoping to pass on to us in his writings, and that is that Jesus had a normal childhood. He was fully man. And we'll talk a little bit more about the idea of incarnation and what it means to this story later. But as the question pops in our head, why aren't there more stories from Jesus' childhood? It's good to remind ourselves that there's probably no stories in those gaps because there was nothing worthy of noting. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 says this, And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you, and do them that you may live, and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord the God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. And listen to this from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Basically, we don't need to add anything more. What we have in the canon of Scripture is sufficient. So let's get back to our text. Mary and Joseph take 12-year-old Jesus to Jerusalem to observe the Passover feast. Now this was a big deal. Jerusalem normally had a population of about 25,000 people. But at Passover, the city swelled up to 100,000 people. The city boomed with excitement and it was an important celebration. And it was normal to bring your 12-year-old with you since at age 13, Jewish boys would have their bar mitzvah where they officially became a man. Now, most parents brought their sons to Jerusalem to see the city, the temple, and to experience the celebration in anticipation for the big jump to adulthood. After the celebration was over, everyone packed up and headed back home. And it was customary in this day and age to travel by caravan with everyone from your village and the surrounding area as a means of safety. And so mothers and young children would start out first. And if you've ever tried getting from point A to point B with a toddler, then you know why this group needed to leave first. But then the men and young men would leave second, oftentimes catching up with the women and the young children when it was time to set up camp. Based on this arrangement, we can see how Mary and Joseph could lose track of young Jesus, who was in the middle, caught between the age of child and young man. No one really knows exactly how it all went down, but Mary left and most likely assumed that Jesus was with Joseph, and Joseph left not seeing Jesus nearby, assuming that he was making his last trek home with mom as a child. When they arrived a day journey from Jerusalem, you can picture Mary going to Joseph, how was the trip? How did Jesus do keeping up? And Joseph was like, I don't know, I thought he was with you. And this reminds me of when I was a kid. I'm the oldest of four. I have two younger brothers and a sister. My brothers and I are only a couple of years apart. And we grew up playing sports. 
We swam for the Tulare Sharks, played Pop Warner football, and we played a lot of baseball. One Saturday when I was 10 or 11, all three of us boys had games at the Little League Park right here in Tulare. And I remember finishing my game, packing up my bag, and sprinting to the snack bar for a free icy before I rejoined my family to head home uh, to the car. We got in the car, we buckled up for safety, and we headed for home. We got home, unloaded the car, and we headed inside. And I remember it like the scene straight out of Home Alone. My parents realized that they left my middle brother, Dalton, back at the Little League Park. They hurried back and they found him teaching all of the coaches and umpires all about America's greatest pastime. No. And they found him running around with a bunch of other kids and having the time of his life like a 10 or 11 year old is supposed to be doing. Forgetting my little brother at the baseball fields was funny to me at that time. It's still a little bit funny today. But I, when, when I reread this story of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, now as a father of, three, of a three-year-old, it hit me differently this time. If you're a parent, I'm sure you've had that moment of sudden anxiety when you lost sight of your kid. It's immediate. Your heart begins to race. The question, where's my kid, doesn't just linger in your head. It comes bursting out of your mouth over and over again, and you search desperately until you find them. All the while, every bad thought is rushing through your head. I did it just the other day. I'm mowing the lawn in the backyard with the garage door open to the front yard and Willow is supposed to be playing in the sandbox. I made a couple of passes and I look up, she's not in the sandbox. Where is she, right? That's what goes through my mind. I yell for her as loud as I can, Willow! I start rushing to the door and then I hear, Dad, I'm right here. There's no greater relief. When I heard this scripture again, I put myself in the shoes of Mary and Joseph who had to wait three days to find Jesus. They had already traveled for an entire day without him. It took another day just to get back, and it took the third day to find him. Can you imagine the thoughts that went through Mary and Joseph's heads? We lost the Savior of the world. God, he can forgive a lot of things, but I don't know if he can forgive us when we're talking about losing the Son. Is he safe? Is he hurt? Is he scared? You know, a parent's mind can race at a time like this. And here's the first thing that I want us to take from this scripture today. We never lose sight of Jesus without suffering loss. There's no doubt Mary and Joseph suffered a feeling of loss those three days. And I know this to be true in my life, right? As days of skipped Bible reading and prayer time turn into weeks, I notice a difference in my life, in my attitude, in my demeanor. It's a posture of loss. We never lose sight of Jesus without suffering loss. And when I notice this in myself, I know that I must repent and turn back to Christ with the same urgency that Mary and Joseph displayed as they searched every square inch of Jerusalem for Christ. This feeling should be the same feeling that we have when we recognize that we have drifted away from Christ. We should rush to find him in our sorrow, saddened that we didn't realize sooner what we had done. It's not like when you pack the car to head somewhere and you get in the car and you say to yourself, I feel like I'm forgetting something. What is it? But you don't actually get out of the car. You just sit there and you think about it. And you double check the list of things in your head. And then you say, I mean, I can't think of anything. I I guess I'll find out when I get there. See, this is different. This is take the keys out of the ignition and search until you can't search any longer. And then you search again because it's that important to you. See, as we start a new year, maybe you need to ask yourself that question. Where is Jesus? I can't start this year without him. Well, when Mary and Joseph do find Jesus, they don't find Jesus in the market. He's not with the rest of the kids playing in the street. No, he's found in the temple. And this is fascinating because finding Jesus in the temple marks a pivotal moment in the life of Jesus. Jesus was assuming his rightful place among the adults in the temple. He was no longer confined to the women's court in the temple. He was stepping into adulthood with all of the responsibilities assumed by men at that day. And with these responsibilities came great privileges. Jesus was now able to have dialogue and ask questions of some of the best and brightest theologians of his time. And you have to remember, it's Passover time. So all of the greatest teachers and rabbis all gathered in the same place. And this is what they did when the festival was over. They gathered together and they talked shop, which to them was deep theological ideas and the meaning of the scriptures. And not only was this 12-year-old Jesus able to listen and keep up, He asked big questions that scripture says caused all who heard him to be amazed at his understanding and his answers. So where did 12-year-old Jesus get this wisdom? 
See, this is a question that came to my mind, and I'm sure it's come to yours as well as you've listened to the scripture. And my first thought was, well, he's God incarnate. And if God is omniscient, all-knowing, then so is Christ, right? But Jesus was both fully God and fully man. That's what we believe as Christians. But that's not always what Christians believed. You see, in fact, it wasn't decided until 451 AD when the church was faced with several inadequate views on the person of Christ. The two competing views in the early church were Nestorianism, which was the idea that there were two separate persons in Christ, a human person and a divine person. And this is obviously different than what the Bible says about Jesus being one person. But then there was monophysism, which is the idea that Christ had one nature only. And this view denied that the human nature and the divine nature in Christ remained fully human and fully divine. But rather, the human nature of Christ was taken up and absorbed by the divine nature of Christ so that both were changed into a third kind of blended nature. Wayne Grudem put it this way, think of a drop of ink being put into a glass of water. The resulting mixture is neither ink nor is it pure water. It's a new substance. Neither of these ideas are biblical and neither of them stood up to the theological testing. So if we start with his humanity, then we see that Jesus had human weaknesses and limitations just like us. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He grew physically weak. And at the end of Jesus' life on earth, we know what happened to his body on the cross. His human body ceased to have life in it. And it ceased to function, just like ours does when we die. Luke even tells us in our passage today that Jesus increased in wisdom. So like us, he matured in his mental abilities as he grew older. And we know that his mental ability had limitations. Listen to what he says in Mark chapter 13, verses 30 through 32. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Okay, so Jesus was fully man with a fully human brain. But how does 12-year-old Jesus know more than the teachers of his day? How can the scholars of this time be so amazed by a 12-year-old? R.C. Sproul, one of my favorite Bible teachers, put it this way, and I'm summarizing a bit. The Bible teaches us that Jesus was sinless. So while he was fully man, he did not have to deal with the ramifications of sin. Jesus was able to live out the law perfectly. So think about this. In Matthew 22, Jesus is asked this question, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Now, not one of us could say that we have loved God with all our heart, with all our soul, and especially with all our mind. But Jesus did. See, he loved God with all his mind, his entire life leading up to this moment where he would share everything he had learned about the law, and that's what set him apart. Sin clouds our mind. It distracts us. It keeps us from bringing out our very best to serve God. But there was one who knew no sin and yet became sin so that we could be made right with God again. The end of our scripture today has to do with the exchange between Mary and young Jesus in the temple. And our scripture says, Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. Why did you need to search? He asked. Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? See, Jesus' answer to his mother here is critically important, and not just because they are the first words recorded of Jesus. A 12-year-old boy answers his mother, didn't you know I must be in my father's house? In other words, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? Notice Jesus didn't say, I should be about my father's business, or I ought to be about my father's business, but instead he uses the word must. When the word must is used, we're getting closer to the heart of of life. Jesus demonstrated that here. He was making it known that there was a divine plan for him, a mission that he was called to do with his time on earth, and he knew that he was called to do, and he knew what what he was called to do with his life. A 12-year-old who knows the purpose of his, his existence? Wow. At 12 years old, I couldn't tell you what the purpose of my life was if it, like, depended on it, right? And it's pretty amazing. But really, If we would commit ourselves to the teaching of the word and take seriously our role as Christian parents and as Christian leaders in our communities, then our 12-year-olds would know their purpose of existence too. If you don't know your purpose, then let me share it with you now. 
The Westminster Catechism, written in the 1600s for the Christians in Scotland and Britain, sums up the Bible's teaching on the meaning of life perfectly. It says, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. So Jesus had his mission at 12 years old. And while his parents may not have understood it all yet, he did. The scripture says, but they didn't understand what he meant. And then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. And so 12-year-old Jesus would return to Nazareth with his parents. And at no time does he, uh, the knowledge of who he was make Jesus too proud to submit himself to his parents. He matures in his young adulthood. He fulfills the responsibilities ex- uh, expected of the eldest son at the time. And then at some point, Joseph disappears from the scene and Jesus became the man of the family. And we know from scripture that he worked his trade as a carpenter. He supported his family. He loved his God and he proved himself completely faithful in a thousand small ways before he formally entered his appointed ministry. So this morning, I challenge you again to put yourself in Mary and Joseph's shoes and answer this question. Am I missing something? Where's Jesus? Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As believers in Christ, we are to keep Christ in our hearts, mindful of his presence and his leading in our lives. May Christ be magnified in our hearts today. Let's worship him. Stay.